Hello, this is Christine Faulkner with Cobb and Faulkner, and thank you for joining us for Family Wealth Preservation Planning, planning for a lifetime of protection, guidance, and love. So it's nice to have a face to the voice on our webinar tonight. And so this is a picture of me quite a while ago, uh, but other, otherwise, this is pretty much what I look like. My glasses are a little bit different. And I love to have a picture of my why. These are my two sons, Cameron and Daniel. This picture was taken quite a while ago when my younger son was in fourth grade on my eldest in sixth. They're now 21 and 23 years old. And these are the people who are so important in my life. And I imagine that you probably have folks like this in your life as well. And you're wondering why these are the people that I want to protect and how can I go about getting educated to do that? So I love this picture. We created this when COVID first began and this is definitely still a depiction of what's happening right now. We never know what's going to be open, what's going to be closed. And this particular picture tickled me we all know how important it is for us to get our hair cut, get our hair done so that we can look great. And it certainly has been a challenge over the past six months. So in terms of our COVID-19 practice, again, it's been a it's been an interesting time for sure. And I would like to definitely say we're doing meetings automated we are doing our meetings virtually and remotely and on very rare occasions if people don't have the ability to do an online meeting we will meet with folks in person but to keep all of us safe we're definitely trying to do our best to do our meetings in a virtual meeting space so far so good over the past six months it's worked out really well but i want to let you know that we definitely have a way to keep both you and me safe, as well as my staff and your family by doing online meetings. They are quite easy and probably you're well versed in getting on Zoom by this point in time. But if you're not, we'll absolutely walk you through it. So why did you come today? The question is different for everyone. Maybe you came because you want the total comfort and assurance of knowing that you know what to do if something happens to you should you become incapacitated or pass away or that your family has a plan in place to jump into action should the worst happen maybe you came because you want to know exactly what's going to happen to my assets if something happens to me it's a great question and it's on many people's minds right now we're in a complete state of uncertainty with a recent election so Knowing what will happen to your assets is so important to begin the process of getting educated. Perhaps you want to know about estate tax, and I have to tell you, given the outcome of the election, it's really uncertain, but we know what the estate tax is right now. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but just know that when 2021 comes around, we could have a completely different tax structure or maybe towards the end of 2021. So it's anyone's guess, it's always a moving target and it's good to know that. It's good to know that the tax law can change and it's important to always be working with an advisor who can keep you up to date and abreast of those changes. Perhaps you came because you want to know what the heck would happen if you became incapacitated, who would make choices for you? who would be that person or people who would be making potentially end of life decisions for you? And actually, would the choices that you make for yourself be honored by those people? If you came for any of those reasons, you came for the right reasons because we're gonna cover all of that today. And you're going to get the peace of mind of getting a real roadmap on knowing just how to put in plan, put in place a legal plan for the people that you love the most, to know that you have the peace of mind and they'll know exactly what to do in terms of getting into action should something happen to you. 
So perhaps you already have a plan in place. And the question is, when was the last time you had that plan reviewed? If you haven't had it reviewed, then probably a good time to think about, is it important to have that plan reviewed by an attorney to make sure it's still gonna work for you? Or maybe you have no plan at all. And whether you know this or not, the plan, the state does have a plan in place for you. So let's talk about what the usual and typical estate planning attorney experience looks like. So many estate planning attorneys are transactional attorneys. You are going to exchange money for a one-time transaction where you're likely to get form documents from this attorney who may or may not specialize in estate planning. Perhaps they are a jack of all trades. Perhaps they do a little bit of bankruptcy, a little bit of personal injury, a little bit of family law, and a little bit of estate planning. Maybe they've just passed the bar and are hanging their shingle for the first time. And you may work with someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, or perhaps you won't get a lot of time with the actual attorney themselves, but may end up working with a paralegal who is the one who is actually preparing these documents. The question, of course, is always going to be, will this plan avoid probate? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Will the plan avoid estate tax? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. You won't ever really be certain of that because you are working with a transactional attorney, meaning you're going to work with the attorney to prepare the plan, but then won't likely have any further communication with them. And you'll never really know as the law changes or as your assets change, whether the plan is going to fully protect your family. There's a fair likelihood that your assets will be unprotected, despite the fact that you've paid good money to put a plan in place. And of course, you're not going to get that oh so important ongoing legal guidance to close that gap and make sure that as your assets change over time and as the law change, you are fully informed as, exact, as to exactly what you need to do to make sure that your assets are titled correctly and that there will never be a probate in your family because you are educated and empowered. And potentially, your assets could be lost to the Department of Unclaimed Property because your assets haven't been properly documented and your family doesn't know that you own these assets. Isn't it horrible to think about working hard in your life to create perhaps retirement accounts and having your family be unaware that those account, accounts exist so they go unclaimed at the time you pass away? That's how assets end up in the Department of Unclaimed Property. And so the question is, Will the plan work when your family needs it the most? I work with many, many families. I've been practicing in estate planning for over 15 years, and I have the unfortunate experience to work with families who usually they're adult children. Their parents went to a lawyer and paid good money to have a plan created, and the kids come to me, and I end up having to tell them, Unfortunately, you're going to end up potentially in probate or at the very least you're going to end up in court because the real estate wasn't titled correctly. And so when you create a, a trust and the real estate is still held in the parent's name rather than held in their names as trustees of their trust, it is likely not going to avoid probate. And I'm unfortunately the one who has to tell folks we can try to go to court and petition the court to see if we can get this piece of real estate put back into the trust. If we're successful, it may take a couple of months and a couple of thousand dollars more to accomplish that. But if we're not, you're going to end up in a full-blown probate. And that's all because people were probably afraid to go back to their attorney because they knew that they would get charged by the hour. That's what happens when you work with transactional attorneys. 
I like to talk about what it is that we do at Coven Faulkner, and I call that planning for life. It's a whole new experience where we're helping you to make really informed and empowered decisions. We're going to make sure that we're saving your family thousands of dollars because they're not going to end up in court paying even more money after the plan was originally created because an asset wasn't titled correctly because they didn't have that ongoing legal guidance. The assets are not going to be lost to the Department of Unclaimed Property because your family is always going to know what assets you own at any given time. We can even create planning to protect your family from outsiders, from creditors and predators. And of course, working with Coven Faulkner, you're going to receive a lifetime of right legal guidance and to help you make the very best financial choices. And ultimately, the goal is always to keep your family out of court and conflict, because when you work with an attorney, you want to know that your plan is going to work when your family needs it the most. So if you don't have a plan, the state, believe it or not, has an estate plan already created for you. If you become incapacitated and you have no planning in place, that, that plan with the state is called conservatorship. In other words, going to court where a judge is going to decide who is going to be the guardian of you. Because you are a legal adult, a guardian has to be appointed. So potentially a judge could appoint someone to be the guardian of your person, and that guardian would be someone who would make decisions about your medical care, about how and where you live. And that might not be the person or people that you would want to be making those decisions for you. Those people might not honor the decisions you would want made for your body and the healthcare decisions that you would want made. If you pass away and you have no plan in place, then potentially you could end up in a court process called probate. And that process happens because you have certain kinds of assets that are worth more than $166,000. And so if you do fall into that category, you do have titled assets that are worth more than $166,000, such as a piece of real estate. And I like to tell people, anyone who lives in California who owns a home is likely going to go through probate because that asset is definitely worth more than $166,000. So, You'll, your, your family and the asset will end up in a court process called probate. And so you can see from looking at this slide, probate is a slow process. We have like this pipe and the pipeline in probate is slow. You're looking at having to pay attorney's fees, executor's fees, appraiser's fees, bond premiums, creditors, fees, filing fees, and the process is so much slower than if you had put a plan in place. And so we like to call probate a lawsuit that you file against yourself with your own money for the benefit of your creditors. I also tell people that probate is only for people who don't plan. It's not an automatic but if you choose not to create a plan and be proactive about putting a plan in place that is going to protect your loved ones and your assets, probate is likely where you'll end up being. So this is the last will of Jackie Kennedy Onassis. And the thing that's interesting about looking at this slide is the fact that there's a lot of detail here. There's a tremendous amount of detail that you can look at and you can see exactly what Jackie O left and to whom she left it to. And the point here is that even if you have a will, it is public so people can actually read what it is that you have left to whom and when they're going to get it and how much. So many of my clients really value their privacy. They want to avoid having this sort of experience where people can delve into the nitty gritty of what it is that they wish to leave. And they'd rather preserve their privacy in a 
robust estate plan. The other thing about having a will is that having a will alone does not avoid probate if you own real estate in California. So in other words, you'll still end up going through that court process called probate, even if you have a will. So think about how do you value your privacy? How do you want to show up in terms of having a plan in place that is easy and quick and expeditious? as well as private versus a plan that is slow and cumbersome and expensive and public. So make a note to yourself that even if you have a will, you will likely still end up in probate if you have an asset that is titled that is worth more than $160,000. The other thing about not having a plan in place, or even if you have a will, and let's say that you have minor children, your beneficiaries will receive assets outright and unprotected when they turn 18. So I know when I created my estate plan, it was something that I was very concerned about with respect to my own children who were quite young at the time, probably eight and 10. I wanted to make sure that my children did not receive assets when they turned 18 because we all know and we probably know people who have received assets when they were quite young and how it has the tendency to impact a person's a young person's uh, maturation many times when young people come into money they spend it all over a very short period of time and it can really delay their interest and willingness to get an education and to mature in the way that we like to see our children mature. So when you don't have a plan in place, you absolutely have no control over when your children receive your assets. They will receive everything outright according to the law when they become adults. So if you wanna make sure that this doesn't happen to your children or your beneficiaries, think about the importance of putting a plan in place where you can decide when your children will receive the assets, when the time is right according to your best judgment, not theirs, uh, not when the law says they have become a legal adult at 18. Even if you have a will, your children could be at risk. So if you have minor children, have you named guardians for your children, both short and long term? Many people don't think about this, and it's one of those responsibilities that we as parents really need to pay attention to in creating an estate plan. And that is, if something happens to us, if we become incapacitated, should we develop dementia or have a stroke and be incapacitated for a period of time it's so important that we have named short-term guardians for our children. Those are what we call first responders. It's so important as well that we are thinking about who we would want to be guardians or who would stand in our stead if we were to unfortunately pass away and we still had minor children at home. I know that many of my clients have very specific people in their lives that they do and don't want to be guardians. If you don't have a plan in place naming guardians, then you unfortunately don't get to choose. And the person who'll be deciding who will be raising your children until 18 will be a judge. And as you can imagine, if something were to happen to you, if you're married to you and your spouse, there are probably many people in your life who would step up and wish to be the guardian for their, your children. And they may not exactly be the people that you would want. Many times when parents pass away, the guardianship proceeding can be a very painful experience for family members who are fighting against one another in court to step up and be chosen to be the guardian. It can cause um, division within the family and unfortunately divisiveness is not the outcome that anybody wants when it comes to choosing who will be the best surrogate parents for your children. So something to think about whether you have named guardians for your children, even if you do have a will. 
those are usually the long-term guardians, but have you named those short-term guardians and first responders to come and care for your children in the hours and days or even weeks uh, until a more long-term solution can be reached to raise your children or for the people to be with your kids if you are on a short-term kind of incapacity situation. If you don't have any kind of guardianship in place and something happens to you, you need to understand that there's a very real likelihood that your minor children will end up with CPS, in, even if it's for hours or days until someone can step in and come up with a short-term solution. I know many of the clients I work with, none of them ever want to see their kids with CPS, even for a moment. So we put in place what's called kids protection planning, which not only, of course, incorporates long-term guardianship or who would be the surrogate parent for your kids if you were to pass away until they become 18, but short-term first responders, and those are the people who are probably more local, who would be there for your children in the hours, days, or weeks uh, during a short-term incapacity or disability. You want to make sure that these people not only have the legal documents to empower them to step in and care for your beloved children, but also know what to do and also what not to do, who not to call. With kids protection planning, we give you a card for your wallet. So if something were to happen to you and you were in an accident, the authorities would know that you have minor children at home and who exactly to get in touch with to make sure that your kids are protected. So think about this, think about the long-term ramifications of either having no plan in place for guardians or not having a fully, a fully um, well thought out plan, which involves both short and long-term guardianship and what that can mean for your kids if there is any gap in your planning. So I don't know if you know who this person is. Many of you may, some of you may not, depends on probably what generation you're in, but this is Terry Schiavo. And this is a very sad story of a family who didn't have any planning in place. And so believe it or not, Terry Schiavo was 28 years old when she had a cardiac event and went into a persistent vegetative state. She was married, and but she had no planning documents in place. She did not have an advanced healthcare directive in place naming an agent to stand in her shoes should she become incapacitated. And so she was kept on life support for a number of years and her husband, after that period of time, believed that his wife would not have wanted to be kept in that state and perpetuated in a state on life support uh, for, you know, the end of, until the end of time. His parents, however, understandably wished to keep her on life support with holding out hope that she would eventually regain consciousness and be able to live a normal, productive life. And so without that so important legal document, the Advanced Health Care Directive, a court battle ensued between her husband and her parents at opposites, opposite ends of a litigation table. Very painful. It was a years-long litigation that went up and down the state of, uh, I believe it was Florida, and you can see the sign asking the governor to step in and take action. Of It went up and down the courts of appeal and up to the highest court in the state. Thousands of dollars were spent on this litigation and found this family was really torn apart. Eventually, her husband was given the right to make the decision and he was able to take his wife off of life support, which is what he believed she would have wanted. Of course, 
maybe they had a conversation about it, but her, her wishes were not properly documented in the right legal documents to make it very clear as to exactly what she wanted. Had she done so ahead of time, it would have saved a lot of heartache, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and things could have happened quickly and privately as opposed to playing out in public as it did. So think about what you want for yourself. Do you want to choose the people who make healthcare decisions for you? Do you want to know that you can trust those people to carry out the wishes that you want for your bodily autonomy? And when it comes to end of life decisions that you know those people will make the decisions that are congruent with your own wishes to either pull the plug if that is the decision that you wish or to keep you on life support. But obviously this is all about exerting control over your future if you become incapacitated. The sad thing is that after you become incapacitated, it is absolutely too late to be able to make a decision about this. It's so important to create your incapacity planning while you're alive and avoid the cost and the divisiveness of litigation between people who care about you. So sometimes people ask me about, you know, what's called poor man's estate planning. And I like to talk about some of the, the reasons that this kind of planning really doesn't work. So sometimes I'll have parents say to me, well, you know, rather than creating a trust or any kind of an estate plan, I'll just title my property with my adult children. So especially if you're single uh, and you own property in your own name, if you pass away, there's a high likelihood that that property will end up in probate and your family will be dealing with that the costs and invasiveness and time consuming aspects of probate. And so many times parents will suggest, well, what if I just put my children on the property with me? Then when I pass away, it will just roll over to them automatically and I don't need to put any kind of an estate plan in place. The problem with that is that when you hold title jointly, you take on the risk of the creditors of your joint owners. So whether you are married or single, if you have jointly owned property and your co-owner has some type of creditor issue, they end up in bankruptcy, they're in a lawsuit because of some negligence, or they have some business um, matters for which they're being sue, sued and their personal property is up for grabs. If you are a joint owner, that means your property is up for grabs in that litigation or bankruptcy as well, and you could lose it. So a really good reason not to put adult children onto your property is because you're buying into uh, potentially exposing your property to their creditors. Designating a beneficiary works on, des on beneficiary designated accounts, but you need to make sure that you have named the right beneficiaries and enough. Otherwise, you could still en end up in probate court. And many types of assets don't have a beneficiary designation, so it doesn't really solve the problem for every asset that you own. Signing a will is a great first step, but as we've talked about, having a will alone does not protect you from that court process called probate. If you own property, property worth more than about $160,000 here in California, you'll still end up pro in a probate process even though you signed a will. And relying upon a trust schedule alone to protect you, to keep out of the Department of Unclaimed Property is not going to work. The only foolproof way to avoid court, to avoid that probate process to, is to have a fully funded revocable living trust with disability provisions. And so, what that looks like is creating a trust 
and retitling your investment accounts, signing new signature cards at the bank to put your bank accounts into the trust, to put your investment accounts into the trust, creating new deeds to your real estate to put your real estate into the trust, making sure that if you own individual stock certificates or bond certificates that you retitle those assets into your name as trustee of your trust, assigning all of that personal property that you have, your furniture, artwork, all of the things in your life that don't necessarily have a title, but assigning that to make sure that the trust governs how that property is disposed of. And then of course, for those accounts that do have beneficiary designations, being very careful to change the beneficiary designations to the people you want for both primary and contingent beneficiaries to ensure that after you pass away, you have the outcome that you're looking for. And this is especially important when you have minor children. So let's talk about what happens if you're not able to avoid court, if you don't have a revocable trust. If you have property worth more than $166,000, such as a piece of real estate, and let's say that you're single and you pass away with that property in your own name, there is no way to pass that property on to the people that you love most in your life. Because if you remember, when you went to the title office to uh, either purchase the home or sell the home, you had to sign, of course, reams and reams of paperwork. And your signature is your legal ability to convey that property or to purchase that property, right? To transfer title either into your name or out of your name to the name of another person. If you're no longer alive, there is no way to transfer title to the property that you owned, say to your children. It, there is no automatic transfer of title. And so if the property ends up in court, and let's say on average, I think where I'm from in Northern California, the median home price right now, fair market value is about probably $450,000. If that $450,000 home ended up going through probate, it would cost about, let's see, it's about 5% of the, the fair market value of the asset. So you're looking at about $22,000, $22,500 just for that one asset to go through the probate court. Now, on average, people have many more assets that would end up in probate. And so if you think about the usual types of assets that people have, they've maybe got a $450,000 home, they've got bank accounts and investment accounts that are worth a couple hundred thousand dollars and retirement accounts. Many of those accounts, especially retirement account, accounts, have beneficiary designations. Depends on who you've named as beneficiaries, but if you have minor beneficiaries, you can count on those accounts going through probate as well. So let's assume the average asset value going through probate is somewhere between $800,000 and a $1 million. You're looking at a cost of 5% of that value. So anywhere from forty dollars to $50,000 is the cost to go through probate. And it's a really shocking number, and many people don't have any idea about any of this. So Think about that. Think about what that forty to fifty thousand dollars could mean for your family, and whether how you feel about having that go to an unnecessary, um, lengthy, invasive court process, rather than going into your family's pockets. And for us, that meant maybe a year of college for our sons. And so that was a really important uh, thing for us to do for our family. And I know that for many people, forty dollars to $50,000 is a huge amount of money to lose in an unnecessary court process. 
the great thing is that you don't have to be exposed in that way. You don't ever have to go through probate, but it does require you making an affirmative decision that you want to avoid court. You want to avoid that heartache and the considerable costs going through pr probate. And instead, being proactive, getting financially organized, and deciding that you want to work with an attorney who can create a really robust plan to make sure that your family will never have to go through pro through probate. Because let's face it, it's not going to be you who goes through probate. It's going to be your family who feels the, the pain of the time investment and the the monetary investment of getting pro going through that probate process just so that you can get the assets that you want them to have there's definitely an easier way and that is working with an estate planning attorney who is well versed in creating this kind of planning for people so that you'll you, you can rest assured that your plan your family will never end up in probate court so one of the other great things that I've talked to people about for a long time and I've found, especially this year in 2020, people have really shown a great deal of interest in making sure that they can create a plan that leaves assets for their spouse if they're married and also or for their children in an asset protection trust so that if something happens to the spouse or to the children, that the assets that you have left behind for them can be protected from their creditors. It sounds like a pretty cool idea. And like I said, this year especially, I've had many, many clients who have decided they want to create asset protection for the surviving spouse because they want to make sure if some catastrophe happens, the spouse has a nest egg to rely upon that couldn't be taken in a bankruptcy. And the same thing is true of their kids. How cool would it be if you could create a plan that ensured that the assets you leave for your children cannot be taken by your children's creditors? It, it's what's called dynasty trust planning. And it is a very nifty way to ensure that if your children marry and end up in a nasty divorce, the assets that you've worked so hard for will stay with your children instead of being lost in that divorce proceeding because your children have commingled those assets with their spouse. Or if a child would had to file bankruptcy, because you have created this dynasty trust planning for them, those assets will always be protected from a, a bank, bankruptcy proceeding and your children will have that nest egg to live on, even if they lose much of what they've worked hard for because of the bankruptcy. So there's so many reasons and unforeseen things that can happen in people's lives that uh, bring on a creditor or a lawsuit. This year is particularly poignant because there will be many people likely who will end up filing bankruptcy because of COVID-19 and the unforeseen impacts that the coronavirus has had on their business, had on their ability to work and to continue to support their family due to no fault of their own. And because those bankruptcies will likely be filed because they were unable to meet their financial obligations, it's going to have a devastating impact on the assets that they've worked so hard for over the course of their lives. And that's something that you can actually create a plan ahead of time to protect both your loved ones, your surviving spouse, and your children from unforeseen catastrophes such as what we're seeing happening this year. So think about that and whether you find any value in that in working with an estate planning attorney to create that kind of plan. So what about estate taxes? Right now, we have a really, really large estate tax exemption, which is a gift from our government. So right now, the exemption for all of us, each person, is $11.58 million per person. So for a married couple, we're talking over $23 million in exemption. So what does that mean? That means that 
Unless you have over $23 million and you're married, you'll likely never have to pay an estate tax, which is great news. But if you have to happen to be lucky enough to be in that tax bracket and you're single and you've got worth, uh, you know, assets worth more than $11.5 million or you're married and you have assets worth more than $23 million, then there's a whopping tax that will have to be paid, which is the highest tax that exists, and that is for transfer taxes, and that is gifts, gift and estate taxes. It's 40%. So whatever amount you have over the estate tax exemption is you will we'll pay back to the federal government at 40 cents on the dollar. The thing about the estate tax exemption is that is it, a, it is a moving target. And so now that we have passed the election in 2020, I think it's still up in the air about what will happen. There will probably still be some legal challenges. But if there is a Democrat in the White House, there is a reasonable likelihood that this estate tax exemption of 11.58 million will be dramatically reduced and it may even occur as early as 2021. So what if we're looking at a $2 million exemption or a $4 million exemption that's going to impact many, many more people? And so it's not that unusual for folks to have a three or four or five million dollar estate. And if that is in fact the case and you have uh, the estate tax is the estate tax exemption is reduced. Looking at doing some more advanced estate tax planning is probably in the cards and worthwhile considering, so that you never have to be exposed to paying that forty cents on the dollar. Being aware of the fact that the exemption changes and it can change from year to year is really important. And that's one of the reasons why I talk about it, because honestly, most of my clients don't fall into the uber wealthy category. Uh, and with such a high exemption, there's not much to be concerned about. But knowing that the exemption could drop in any given year is important to know. What we do know right now at this very moment is the way the law is drafted the estate tax exemption will continue to rise annually for cost of living. So every year it'll go up a little bit. And if there is no change in the law in 2025, well, really the end of 2025, January 1st, 2026, it will revert back to the 2018 uh, exemption, which was $5.48 million per person. So still quite a generous exemption but not, you know, it's about half of what we have now. And that can impact people adversely. So understanding that the law can change at any time is really important. And thinking about where you stand if you don't have any kind of planning in place with respect to this exemption is important. Right now, I'm not sure of the exact value of what is in the California Department of Unclaimed Property, but when I last looked, it was over $9 billion, and $9 billion. And that is because people acquire assets and then they lose track of them. Most people are busy living their lives and they are not keeping close tabs on every asset they own. Perhaps they move employers or the employer goes out of business and they lose track of that asset. As a result, there is $9 billion plus in the Department of Unclaimed Property. And what does that mean to each of us? It means money that we've worked hard for, accounts that we've worked hard to acquire are languishing and may never be claimed. And the point here is the importance of having a way to catalog all of your assets so that if something does happen to you, your family knows exactly what you own and that they can claim every penny of what you left for them. Because truly, isn't that what we all strive for? We work hard, we create accounts, we save, we invest, and we want to make sure that when the time comes, there's not a penny on the table that 
isn't benefiting the people that we love most in our lives or isn't being used to support a charity that we that we do support and would love to to um, you know uh, support with our through our state plan rather than sitting in the Department of Unclaimed Property. Working with an attorney that's going to help you get financially organized and put your assets together in such a way that your family will always know where to find it, I think is something you should consider whether how it feels to you thinking that some of your property could be and maybe already in the Department of Unclaimed Property and just what you can do about that to proactively plan in the future to claim anything that's already there and prevent even more of your assets ending up in the Department of Unclaimed Property and what that would mean to your family in the long run. Have you ever thought about the real legacy that you leave? So think about not just this estate planning, planning binder that you would put together with all of the documents, but really what is a legacy? And if you had to choose between the people you love in your life receiving just your money or being able to leave a story of your values, insights, experiences and thoughts on philanthropy, religion, education, which of those would you choose? One of the things that I do at my firm that is so important because I believe that estate planning and having a plan in place is about more than just money, but it is about the thoughtfulness that you put into your plan and the legacy that you do leave for the people who come after you. We do what is called a family legacy conversation, which is a recorded conversation where we get to sit down and you have an opportunity to talk about the people you love in your life, the people who were part of your life and so important to you, how you were raised, what your parents taught you, what lessons are so important and your values that you wanna pass on to your kids and your grandkids. It's a wonderful opportunity to be able to put that in a recording. And now that we're meeting online, we can actually do both a, vi a video and an audio we used to just do it do an audio recording but we can actually do a video recording now how cool is that for you to be able to have this recording of you talking to the people who you love most in your life and how do you think that they would love to have that from you so even if you're no longer here they get to see you perhaps or at the very least listen to you talking about how important those people were to you and what it is that made your family what they are and those important people that you would like them to continue to stay in contact with. Those rituals and traditions that are so important to, in families and why they would love for you to, to or, or their children to carry that on. So think about how cool that could be for the people in your life that you love and what that might feel like to you in order to be able to create something for them. So we've talked about what doesn't work and why those things don't work. One size fits all planning that really does leave your family at risk working with people who don't specialize in estate planning, maybe just finish law school or have a variety of different practice areas that pull them away from being very, very well versed in exactly how to create a very robust estate plan. They're fo focused on documents and, and cookie cutter forms Perhaps you don't even work with the lawyer much. You end up working with a paralegal or a secretary that's doing most of the work. You're working with a cheap lawyer who leaves holes in your planning. And eventually, at the end of the day, your family is not protected in the way that you expect after working with a lawyer and paying good money to create a plan. You'll never really know whether your assets will stay out of court in a probate process or the Department of Unclaimed Property in the event you 
are become incapacitated or pass away, and the inheritance that you leave is not protected from creditors. Your children are are at a high risk of being cared for by people who you, who you may not want caring for them, people you yourself would not choose, but who look the best on paper to a judge in a guardianship proceeding. I know that you don't want them. Uh, you don't want that. You want to exert control over getting to choose who would raise your kids if something happened to you. And many times, you know, these kinds of plans only address your money. They don't address what matters most, which is the legacy that you're leaving behind for those very important people in your life, your spouse, your loved ones. Even if you don't have kids, maybe it's your your animals that you care about so much and other people in your life and charities that you wish to support. So every estate plan starts here at Kava and Faulkner. One of the things that we really pride our, ourselves on is helping our clients get more financially organized than they probably have been in a long time. And the reason for this is we want to help you get organized so that your department, your family is never in the Department of Unclaimed Property searching for what you owned. We're here to help you make informed and empowered choices. And you get to choose the level of planning that is the best fit for you. We have three levels of planning ranging from $2,500 to $8,500. All of our fees are flat fees agreed to in advance and you'll never be surprised by a fee. You'll also know with certainty that your family is going to be expertly guided with care and love throughout your life to make sure that Everything is taken care of and your family will know exactly who to turn to should you become incapacitated or pass away. So I want to make it easy for you and tell you exactly how we do things so that you can look at making your first steps to get things moving. We want to make it as easy as possible for you to do this. So the, your first step in getting things moving forward is deciding whether you wish to make an appointment for a family wealth planning session. Ordinarily, we charge $750 for this session, which is actually a two hour working session where we're both gonna roll up our sleeves, get very familiar with, with what your specific situation is, you're going to be more financially organized than you've probably been in a long time. And you're gonna to get to spend two hours with me, not my paralegal, not my secretary, but actually with me. Now, many attorneys will give you a 15 minute or half hour consultation and make you feel that they're giving you a huge amount of their time. One of the ways that Coven Faulkner is really, really different is we spend time with our fam with our clients who we consider family. We want our clients to feel like family. So when we are working with clients, we are giving you a lot of time. And that is time with me, the attorney, as opposed to, you know, the support staff. And I think that's really important to say because I want you to think about when looking and searching for legal services, you, you have a choice of the kind of attorney you work with, just like anything else in life, we can go online and, and do some research about the kind of lawyer we wanna work with. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how we are different. One of the ways that my firm is different is that we are what is called a relational law firm, or I am a relational estate planning attorney versus transactional. What does that mean? That means that you're gonna get me, you're not going to get my paralegal or my legal assistant, number one. You're gonna to get to work directly with me and I'm not gonna pass you on to someone else. I do have other professionals who help support us in this process, but for the most part, you're going to be working with me. We wanna give you a lot of time to get to know you and understand your specific needs so that we can really create a custom plan that is robust, that will last for not only your lifetime, 
but the lifetime of your spouse if you're married and potentially through the lifetime of your children. So this is a long lasting plan and you can understand the importance of really getting to know what your financial situation is and what your family dynamics are to create the kind of plan that is a custom plan that meets your needs ideally. It is not a plan that we create for the next guy who walks in the door. It is a custom plan just for you. So we are in a two hour working session called that family wealth planning session. And we value that at $750. If you already have a plan in place and haven't had it reviewed in a while, you might want to consider doing a estate plan review. We ordinarily charge $950 for that kind of planning, but here's what I'm happy to offer you. If you need to come in and you're ready to get that family wealth planning session booked or you want to book that estate plan checkup, I'm happy to waive that fee, the $750 fee or the $950 fee, as long as you're willing to do a couple things. We wanna work with people who are committed, who are serious about rolling up their sleeves and having a close look at what they need. And so we have a pretty detailed homework, we call it. It's called a family resource map, but we call it homework. And as long as you're willing to commit to completing that homework and getting it back to us before the family wealth planning session or before the estate plan checkup and review, we are happy to waive that $750 fee or the $950 fee. The other commitment that we ask our prospective clients to make is the willingness to secure the appointment with a credit card. And we that is so important for us because we find that when we don't secure the appointment with a credit card and people think that they're getting something for free, it, we have people who just don't show up for the appointment and because this is how I make a living and I am putting that two hours aside, especially for you, we want to know that you are serious. We will never charge your card. If you need to cancel the appointment, you are absolutely welcome to do that, but we encourage you to keep the appointment because we know that you need to get this planning done and you probably know it as well, but if you need to cancel the appointment, it's no problem. Please just give us a, as much advance note, notice as possible a week or two. That way we have the ability to fill that slot. When we have people who don't show up for their meeting the day of, it really um, leaves us in the lurch because we have no ability to get somebody else in that time slot. So we'd love to offer you some free resources we do a monthly on a monthly mailed newsletter that we kind of have put the kibosh on for the time being because in the beginning of COVID, it wasn't something that we thought people really wanted to see getting or getting too much mail in their mailbox. But we do still do an online weekly newsletter, and we'd love to get that out to you if you're willing to give us your email and your contact information. If you know that you're ready to schedule a family wealth planning session, we're happy to give you that online promo code for a $750 off of the family wealth planning session or the $950 off waiving the session fee. And of course, you're going to use that $750 gift or the $950 gift to ensure that you are creating a thoughtful, robust plan for the people that you love in your life, or you're reviewing the plan to make sure that you are creating a plan or have a plan already that still works for you in the way that you need it to work for your family. So if you want to schedule an appointment, you can do that scheduling online at kavafaulkner.com scheduling that's right there on the screen. You can also call our office at 916-685-1225 
and schedule that way and we will get you going. Or you can email any questions that you have to support at Kava, support at kavafaulkner.com and we'll be happy, happy to answer any questions that you have. You can get to know us on social media. While we don't have the little icon up here, we do have a YouTube channel, Kava and Faulkner, and we're posting content on YouTube every day. So it's a great place for you to go and get to know about us, learn about what we do, and get some great free information that will help you whether you have an estate plan or not. You can certainly follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And we are happy to support you there. I know how important it is for people to do research on the attorneys that they want to work with. You can go, of course, to our website and get a lot of great information about what we do. You can go check out our blog as well. And we're always here to help, of course. So, I like to talk a little bit about questions that people have. Also, this is a couple of, we posted here a couple of testimonials. If you want to read more about our client experiences, absolutely go to uh, Google us, go to our website, and we've got lots and lots of reviews of people who have worked with us in the recent past, and it's a great way for you to see what uh, client experiences have been. We really do pride ourselves on working with clients who value partnering with an attorney who is going to work with them directly, uh, listen, really deeply listen and learn for understanding so that we can create a plan that is the very best fit for your family. And I wanted to say just a couple of things about myself so that you understand who I am. And then I'll answer a couple of kind of commonly asked, frequently asked questions about estate planning. I've been practicing law now for 28 years and I was a litigator for about 14 years and was in a period of transition kind of doing both for a while but as a litigator it gives me the really good insight into how important it is to stay out of court for clients who have been in court it is a very scary costly expensive time consuming um, process but the fear factor is something important to talk about it's an unknown for most lay people, and it is a real negative to have that on your mind, thinking that you have to go to court, or even that people that you love could end up in court. So being a past litigator gives me that insight into why it is so important to stay out of court. So I've been practicing in the estate planning field for about 14 and a half years now, and one of the things that we pride ourselves on is being that relational attorney, the attorney who is going to be seeing you going forward uh, into your lives to make sure that your plan will always work. I have built into my practice a follow-up with all of my clients to check in with them, to let them know when there are changes in the law, and to make sure that as your life goes forward, the changes in your life, the changes in your assets, uh, that we're connecting about those changes and talking about what impact, if any, that has on your planning so that at any given point in time, you have a plan that is going to work for you or at least you have the opportunity to pick my brain and talk about how changes in assets and how changes in the people in your life will impact your planning. And then, of course, you're going to be the one making the decision about whether anything needs to be updated or not. So it's really important, and I talk to people who call for an appointment to really give deep thought to the kind of attorney you want to work with. If you do want, want to work with an attorney who is going to be your lawyer for life, as we call, or your legacy lawyer, be part of your family, as it were, going forward into the future, 
be there to support you and even after you're gone to support the people you love the most and help them through this difficult time. Give them guidance and support and tell them exactly what they need to do. I really encourage you to think about how important that is. I don't have a slide here in uh, this PowerPoint, but I want to let you know that Kava and Faulkner has been voted the best attorney in Elk Grove for seven out of the eight years that the best of Elk Grove was running. Uh, they stopped doing that competition in, I believe, 2019, but seven of the eight years, we were voted the best of the best here in Elk Grove, and that makes me so proud and happy to know that our community supported us in that way and felt strongly about the quality of services that we provide. So what I want to say is that if you're looking for an attorney to provide an excellent level of service to you and your family, to provide a robust and custom plan for you, please think of working with us and scheduling a family wealth planning session or a trust review. We will take good care of you all along the way. As I said, we have a flat fee schedule. And I like to be very transparent about my fees. On average, to create a trust plan, you're looking at fees anywhere from $4,750 to $6,750. And recently, the average fee is probably around $5,000 to $5,500. And what I can say to you about that is that while there is always a cost of planning, whether you make no plan at all or you make a plan, there is always a cost. But clearly, creating a plan to the tune of $4,700 or perhaps $5,500 is far less expensive than ending up in probate court where you're looking at $40,000 to $50,000. And of course, the question becomes then if your assets end up in probate is who is going to pay for that probate? Costs. Will it be your beneficiaries? Will they have to dip into their own bank accounts to pay for that probate court process? And will they have the money? And what about the real cost in time and the emotional cost to your family to have to go through a process that lasts from anywhere from a year to a year and a half to transfer the assets? Or would it be better? more cost-effective and a loving gesture to spend the money, work with an estate planning attorney who specializes in creating custom planning to exert control over creating exactly the plan you want so that you leave a legacy for the people that you love the most. So that's all I wanted to say about how we do what we do. So let me tell you about some commonly asked questions. So, of course, many times folks are wondering, well, you know, how am I going to pay for this? So, I've always been very happy to work with people if they're not able to make the payments that we usually talk about, which is breaking, we break payments up into payments during planning, one third at the time you design your plan and two-thirds when you sign your plan when it comes into existence. But if you're not in a position to do that, I've always wanted to see clients get a plan that they really need, even if it means spreading payments out over time. And I'm happy to do that. I'm always happy to talk to people about how we can make it work for everybody to make sure that our clients are getting the necessary plan to protect the people that they love in a way that it fits best for them. So I also have people ask, you know, if I'm single, what happens if something happens to me and I own real estate? So as I said earlier, if you own real estate and you have title in your name only, your assets will end up in probate and you'll end up in that, you know, 10 to 18 month process that your family will have to step up and end up in probate. They'll likely have to hire an attorney who handles probate. 
if you have no planning in place at all, you also don't get to choose who receives your assets. And so the state has decided that for you. The state indicates that if you have no spouse, that your parents will actually get your assets. And if you have no children, then and your and your parents have predeceased you, then your siblings, your brothers and sisters, will get those assets. And then if you have no brothers and sisters, your aunts and uncles. So the thing about not having any plan in place at all is that it deprives you altogether of getting to decide who you would want to receive your assets. Almost everybody I work with has a very definitive idea of who they want their assets to go to, even if they're not married and even if they don't have children. And many times it's not to their parents and it's not to their siblings. So thinking about how important exerting control and getting to choose your beneficiary may be for you is an important reason to proactively plan. I like to tell people planning is all about um, Planning is all about exerting control in so many different ways. So if you want to decide who will receive your assets, make sure that you create a plan. If you want to decide how your children will receive your assets and when they receive the assets and whether they are asset protected is so important. You are deprived of that choice if you do no planning at all. The cool thing, if you work with an attorney who is well versed in the ins and outs of this kind of cutting edge planning, you can actually create a, le a real legacy for the people that you love to make sure that it's protected from unforeseen circumstances like bankruptcies due to COVID-19 or a car accident or some litigation that, uh, or a bankruptcy. Um, it gives you the ability to protect that legacy that you worked so hard for to leave behind for your family. So another common question is, you know, what happens if I don't have a will in place and I have minor children and I've left my life insurance to my children because I want them to receive that asset? Well, eventually what happens is, first of all, if you have beneficiary protected assets or beneficiary designated assets, leaving them to minor children is not what you want to do because they will end up in probate. Your minor children cannot receive life insurance money and so that asset will, will get pulled into probate. A guardian will have to be appointed for that asset, so a guardian will be appointed to manage that life insurance policy money until your child turns 18. They will probably be charging by the hour to do so, to manage the money. And so it's so important that you not name your minor children, but actually a better way to do that is to name a trust. That way you're not naming your minor children, you're not naming some relative like your parents or your sibling to get the life insurance policy because when you do that, you are leaving the policy them. And while you may implicitly trust your parents or your sibling to use that life insurance money for your children, in reality, they have the legal right to use it however they choose. I always advise my clients to make sure you're leaving the money to the people that you want exactly in the right way and not take any chances with anyone being able to use the money differently. The best way to do that is to create a trust and to designate the trust as the beneficiary of the trust so that your children who are the beneficiaries of the trust as well will have access to the full life insurance money. It'll never get pulled into probate. You won't lose or have to pay money to have that asset uh, probated and have a chunk of change go out the door just to have that asset probated and wait for a year to a year and a half to get the money. So, so important that when you have minor children, you're being mindful of creating a plan to make sure that they are not getting the assets too young. Even though my sons are 21 and 23 now, I still worry about them coming into money too soon and how quickly they would spend it. So being really mindful of creating a very intentional plan 
to protect your kids from themselves, to create a legacy for your children, to receive the money how in the amounts that you want, you know, how you want, when you want, and in the way that you want is one of the greatest benefits of working with an estate planning attorney. So I'd like to tell you, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for tuning in to this presentation. And I'd like to offer you a free gift of $250, a $250 gift certificate off of your planning just for attending this presentation and staying until the end. So when you make your appointment with our office, please let us know that you have attended the webinar and you are looking to get that $250 gift certificate off of your planning. So it is a real reduction in your planning costs. We love to offer this to people who stick in to the end for our webinars and offer it as a freebie to help you. So thank you so much and I hope to see you soon. Take care.